In a week of seismic Brexit shift, where no deal is now pretty much taken off the table, there seems little appetite either for a second referendum. But subject to EU member approval, the UK may be able to buy more time on the triggering of Article 50. Well, will more time be needed if Theresa May takes another look at her deal in a third presentation to Parliament next week? Alexandra Kellett joins us now from Control Risks. Alexandra, good to talk to you. We spoke to you on Monday and your expectations for the week. First of all, has the week panned out as you expected? Well, yes and no. It has felt very chaotic along the way and there have been surprises in terms of, of you know, which amendments were chosen, which ones were voted for. But I think where we've ended up is essentially where we thought we would be. Theresa May's deal was rejected again. No deal was rejected and an extension has, has got the approval of Parliament. So yes. So going to Theresa May's deal and, and our expectations of a further um, look at it next week, possibly for Parliament, do you see that deal as ultimately getting through? I still see it as credible that it could get through, but I think it's very unlikely that it will happen next Tuesday, which is when it's next most likely to come. I think there is still this kind of very hardened group of probably only about 20 or so very, very pro-Brexit um, members of the Conservative Party in Parliament who just won't vote for it under any circumstances. At the moment, there are only few in the handful of Labour MPs who have been prepared to vote for the deal. So at the moment, it still looks pretty deadlocked. So far as what we're hearing now from Labour as well and their resistance, seeming resistance to backing a second referendum, as some had expected them to have done, bearing in mind that it had been part of their, um, their conference uh, proposal last year. Um, do you, what do you see Labour's role in all this? Is it just a question of trashing anything that, that the Conservatives do? Or do they have a, a genuine opposition to what's being presented? I think the Labour Party are as divided as the Conservative Party internally, and that poses an awful lot of problems. As you say, at, at conference, Labour said that they would push for a second referendum. However, my personal view is that Jeremy Corbyn himself is very reticent to do that and will try to exhaust every possible avenue before he goes for that one. Yeah. OK, well, let's, let's, let's take it then that there is this uh, narrowing of the, of, the, of the hurdle that Theresa May has got. She's got less um, opposition to her deal when she presents it next week. What then happens, bearing in mind we've got the EU summit next week, at which she was expected to have signed off on all the agreements that have been passed, and that, that doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, so then we move into this possibility of a request to extend Article 50 triggering date of 29th of March. Is that something the EU is going to entertain? Certainly, and, and there are different options. I mean, one of the problems is at the moment there are very kind of contrasting views coming out of different EU capitals. But I think by next Thursday we'll see a much more united voice. And I think there will be, unless Theresa May can basically present the deal on a platter and say, I have got this signed off, I think the EU will be very opposed to giving a short extension, which is what Theresa May is most likely to ask for. What is a short extension? Really, the maximum will be up to the end of June because the new European Parliament takes office at the start of July and if the UK doesn't participate in those elections, then that will cause a constitutional problem. That is an interesting point. When will we know how long the extension is? Because the candidates have got to be field, obviously, if they're, if they're going to go for those elections at the end of May. Exactly. My understanding is that European elections can be organised in six weeks and there are... The, there have been rumours this week that the Conservative Party are preparing for European elections. So it's certainly feasible that the UK could take part in those. Hmm. In the extension, do you expect some sort of price to be paid for that on behalf of the UK? Not, not a monetary price per se, although obviously the UK would need to continue paying into the EU budget. But I think the EU will want to extract some sort of confirmation and some, want to have some sort of part in the process of how the UK goes forward after that. It's not just going to say, let's have months or years to sit around and talk about this in the same way. In, in terms of payment, I was talking about the monetary value because I had heard that potentially some European nations might want to make some sort of punitive um, application for, for extra money from the UK to, to even dare to ask for this sort of thing. You don't see that happening? I don't... I mean, there might be the old country that wants to push for it, but I don't see the EU as a whole agreeing to that. My understanding is that on a legal footing, until the UK actually formally leaves, it, it has the same membership kind of benefits and responsibilities that it currently has. What do you put the odds are of this being extended so far out that essentially we never actually leave? Never actually leave? Ooh, 
never actually leave probably 10% maybe. Um, but I think a long extension and then... Multiple years? Yes, yeah, at least two years is, is completely credible. Yeah, so that would take us through until oh, when we're looking then at possibly looking for a new government here in the UK. Politically, how do you see the appetite changing for Brexit if we do see that sort of extension? Or do you think by then Brexit fatigue would have taken over, everybody would have given up and say, look, it's a lot easier just dealing with the EU? I mean, I think among the gen amongst the general population, there is already a, a high level of Brexit fatigue amongst those kind of probably more to the middle who don't hold particularly strong views either way. I think on the two ends of the spectrum, though, the pro-Brexit and the pro-Remain sides, I think they will become more and more entrenched. And the longer it goes, goes on, kind of the, the harder it becomes for them to give any ground on that. Yeah. This weekend, uh, Leave Means Leave, the organisation backing a, a Brexit, a hard Brexit, uh, is undertaking a march from Sunderland down to Westminster, which is to coincide with the 29th of, of March. Uh, and that's when they're going to aim to be uh, in London at Downing Street. Do you see along the way that collecting momentum as they, uh, the profile of this begins to build? Uh, and ultimately, I think my question is really, do you see there being some sort of civil um, interaction between the two sides ultimately coming through from this? Uh, I'm thinking perhaps maybe the, the poll tax issue back in the early 1990s yeah. where Margaret Thatcher was forced into a, a, a U-turn over the poll tax. Um, I'm asking whether or not there is any civil disobedience likely to come out of this as we move closer to the 29th of March. I mean, as a general rule, the UK is, is not um, like other European countries like France or Italy where there's a, you know, we're very keen to get out on the streets and, and make our voices heard. So I think the most likely scenario is that the march will have very limited involvement. And so far, actually, generally, although there has been quite a lot of vocal interaction at Westminster where there are kind of camps of the two sides outside the House of Parliament, it has broadly been quite civilised and violence or, or kind of rioting is unlikely. I think there are scenarios where we could see that change, though. One would be if the UK were to unilaterally revoke Article 50 and essentially end the Brexit process, I think that could trigger unrest. The other is if we do end up leaving without a deal on the 29th of March, and that does lead to things like food shortages, then you have, it's not politically driven civil unrest, but just kind of where people are fighting in supermarkets for the last avocado. Or, mm. Yeah, well, we'll see how all that, that's an interesting prospect, but we'll see um, how all that develops. But I, Alexandra, in the meantime, uh, thanks for joining us uh, with a look at just precisely where we are. So uh, looking as though ultimately we could well see some sort of a, a small extension to the 29th of March uh, to see whether or not we can get this uh, deal that Theresa May is still pushing over the line. That was Alexandra Kellett from Control Risks.